When I think of fighting games, the Mega Drive is the absolute first system I think of. I'll sit back in my armchair, pour out a dram of my very best scotch, and think, man, how the hell did we put up with all of that shit? Back in the 16-bit era, almost everybody liked fighting games. They were hot, the big thin, the new black, whatever you wanted to call them, everyone was hungry for them, and they were everywhere. The SNES didn't do all that badly with them. It had six buttons right out of the box, which was all you really needed, and a lot of them came with a pretty kick-ass port of SF2. The Mega Drive, on the other hand, well, fins were tight. I'm sure I've explained this before, but for whatever reason, the majority of fighting games on the Mega Drive were god-awful. It had half of the buttons of the SNES, but that doesn't really excuse how cack-awful a lot of these games were. Heavy Nova, Slaughter Sport, Street Smart... These games have way more problems than just controls, they're broken from the beginning. Three buttons is more than enough to make a good fighting game, but it wasn't seen as enough back in this era. Street Fighter 2's standardisation of the weak, medium, fierce formula really hurt the Mega Drive, it seems, at least until the six-button pad came along. So were all fighting games terrible up until the arrival of that pad? Well, no, there were plenty of good and quite unique ones out there. But the arrival of the six-button pad, and with it all the big arcade ports, it certainly helped matters. And it also means that making a list of the top ten Mega Drive fighting games is really easy. I mean, what have you got? Two Street Fighter ports, four Mortal Kombat ports, a couple of SNK ones, maybe Eternal Champions if you've still got the space, and, you know, Bob's your father's brother. Let's all go for a burger. <sighs> but that just wouldn't be any fun now, would it? Because there are more unique snowflakes out there in the MD's vaults, not to mention a couple of hidden gems, or just plain games that I'd really like to talk about. So I made a little wall for this list. No Street Fighter 2, no Mortal Kombat, no SNK. In fact, every game on here is a console original. Well, except for a couple of Sega games, but the home team should have that privilege. With these restrictions in place, we can actually properly get deep into the world of Mega Drive fighting games. Now, it has to be said that not all of these games are fighters in the strictest sense, and some of them were quite badly received, and one of them, in fact, is commonly regarded as one of the worst games on the console. But you know what? I love them anyway. Well, most of them. Well, okay, a couple of them. But in any case, the time for preamble is over. You can either triumph or die, but not both, because we are counting down the top 10 Mega Drive fighting games. Or Genesis fighting games. Anyway, let's go, go, go! Number 10. Now I tried really, really, really hard to get 10 good, or at least okay, fighting games onto this list. And you know what? I failed. Trico's Fighting Masters gets on the list by virtue of being one of the least awful crappy MD fighters out there. Make no mistake, this is not a game I would recommend to anyone. And yet, well, I can't deny that it has a couple of endearing qualities. Maybe it's the big up its own ass plot about the universe coming to an end and every way sending their champions in to do battle. Or could it be the hilarious names and character designs? Rotundo, Uppercut and Goldrock may be hilariously awful, but well, they're certainly not unmemorable. Or perhaps it's the gameplay itself, which mainly consists of punching a guy once and then throwing them across the arena. Loud, abrasive SFX plays constantly as worlds collide, with the wall usually. It is at least responsive, and it does feel a lot more arcadey than the other early Mega Drive fighters, even if we're hardly talking about a good arcade game here. If you completely switch yourself off and become almost like a vegetable, you may well enjoy Fighting Masters for a few minutes. It's total, total shit, but it does at least have a smile on its face. Number 9. A lot of fighting games in the 16-bit era were licensed. I mean, it's pretty easy to see why. It's not like it's difficult for any old marketing goon to say, hey, you know what, fighting games are big, 
So we should mark it our film, sports star, uh, multi-purpose colostomy bag with a fighting game. I mean, you don't need to be Don fucking Draper to figure that out. Shaq Fu is merely the tip of the iceberg here, folks. But Shaq Fu didn't make the top 10, and nor did most of the other licensed rubbish that came out back in the day. In fact, all three licensed games on this list didn't even come out in the West. And here's the first of them. Get ready, because this list is going Super Saiyan! <laughs> At least I think that's what it's called. Now I know next to nothing about Dragon Ball Z, but I do know that there are a lot of games out there that are tied to it. Hardly surprising, seeing as from what I can see, the series is mainly based around various godless creations fighting against each other. Bandai's Dragon Ball Z Buu Retsuden is just one of many of them, coming out in Japan for the Mega Drive in 94. Weirdly, it was also released in France. The game does have a few features you'd expect. There's lots of charging, big projectile attacks, the ability to fight in the air, and an incredibly long stage. So long that the game has to use split screening. I dread to think what this would have looked like in arcade form. Ooh. These were all neat little touches. And of course, all your favourite characters are here, such as Spiky Head Child, Spiky Head Toddler, Bald Angry Toddler, and Badman. It controls and plays quite easily, but it is, in the end for me, a little bit average. The fights just seem to go on forever, and the lack of variety in the backgrounds really does get kind of dull. I suppose that if you like the show, you'll probably get on a lot better with it than I did. However, there is an altogether superior video game translation of an anime show coming later on in the list that frankly pounds this one into dust. Number 8 We stay in Japan for A Harimanada, a Japanese media franchise that began with a 1991 manga by Kei Sariyasu published in Kodansha's Weekly Morning, citation needed. Oops, shouldn't have read that bit. Anyway, Harimanada is a sumo wrestler, which means that this is a sumo game. Now the topic of sumo games is worthy of a video all on its own. Obviously, none of them came out here in the West, meaning that it's a whole genre of games that most of us have never even touched, probably never even heard of. A lot of them are actually quite complex, with lots of timing and metre management. For the most part, they are very deep games. Aharimanada, however, is not deep. It's like a cross between a sumo game and an out-and-out -out fighter. Is it good? Uh, no, not really. But I still kinda dig it, and it's worth noting because it's the only sumo game on the Mega Drive. The controls are, at the very least, easy to grasp. You pretty much just hammer buttons. A slaps the shit out of your opponent, B slaps the shit out of your opponent only a bit harder, and C initiates a grapple, during which you hammer buttons relentlessly. Standard quarter circle and charge inputs will produce the odd special move here and there, but if you want to win, you better get used to breaking your fingernails on the controller. Grappling can be confusing because there's basically no indication of who's actually winning in the tussle, but I just beat up my joypad and I think I lost precisely one grapple in the whole time I played it, so, you know, there you go. The trouble with the game, aside from it being graphically hideous, is that the hybrid mixture just doesn't work. You end up wishing there was more to it. And yet I still enjoy it in a perverse way. Maybe it's just because I'm not too bad at it, but when you're doing a list like this, that's as good a reason as any, I suppose. If you're looking for a proper sumo game, go check out Azumu Spirits for the SNES. That is a corker. If, for some reason, you're looking for a weird incestuous mishmash of a title that doesn't really excel at anything whatsoever, but gets incredibly crude results, then this is the game for you. Number 7 And here's the first of two Sega Arcade ports, although we're still very deep into flawed game territory, so don't expect too many fireworks. Uh, let's play a guessing game, shall we? I was never a big hit in the arcades, and although Americans would be really interested in my particular subject matter, I was only ever released in Europe and Japan. Who am I? If you guessed Wrestle War, then you've earned yourself a steak dinner. Please shake the hand of the person to your left. You play some guy named Bruce Blade, and you're travelling across America, hoping to become the number one wrestler in the country. 
With thinly veiled facsimiles of top wrestlers all around, Hogan, the Road Warriors, even the late Bruiser Brody, and ready to kick your ass, grappling fun is almost certainly guaranteed. <laughs> yeah. Now what do I like about WrestleRaw? Like Home and Adder, it's a one-way ticket to Button Mashville. It's all you're doing grapples and it'll usually be enough to win them. If you focus entirely on getting the W, this game is incredibly easy. But wrestling isn't really all about that. You've got to have some drama, some stardom, some panache. There's got to be a big finish. Send the fans home happy. And alas, Wrestle War is not good at that. The button mash grappling doesn't help, and nor does the striking, which is unbelievably slow and awkward. To be honest, this game is not good at all. I sat down to grab a bit of footage of it, and 20 minutes later I had actually finished it without breaking a sweat, bored every step of the way. So with all that said, why the hell is this game here? Nostalgia. Plain and simple. Good old nostalgia. I have fond memories of struggling with the game back when I first got the MD, and I remember enjoying myself quite a bit. It helped that I loved wrestling so much. So you know, what can I say? It reminds me of when I first sat down to watch the WWF, mesmerised in the way that only a Lil Nipper can be. Of all the games here, this has perhaps the most and best memories associated with it. But despite that, it's only enough for a place in the lower half of the list, which to be fair is more than most people would give it. Number 6 From wrestlers to robots in one band, <sighs> such is the glory of the Mega Drive. Robots got a bit of a bum deal in the 16-bit era, what with Rise of the Robots and Heavy Nova and whatnot. And you can add Cyborg Justice to the turmoil as well. We're five entries in and the games are still rather, well, squiffy. The trouble with Cyborg Justice is that, in the main, it's a rubbish side-scrolling beat-em-up. It doesn't control all that great, and it moves very slow. You walk, fight two enemies, and just repeat ad infinitum. It's very unfun indeed to play, and as a beat-em-up, it's not worthy of any note. However, there is another side to Cyborg Justice. The game has a dual mode. Nothing out of the ordinary, but what is unique is that you can build your own droid. You can play around with different torsos, legs, and of course weapons, of which there are plenty. And you can use pretty much all of them to great effect. You could also steal your opponent's weapons. And if you really want to finish off an opponent in style, you can rip off their torso. <laughs> Jolly good fun. Playing this mode against the computer is kind of amusing, but the AI is awful beyond belief. However, with another humanoid, the variation and odd little moves actually make it quite entertaining. Cyborg Justice is remembered as a pretty shit game, and in many ways it most certainly is. But it's not a terrible fighter. Now this may be the very definition of damning with faint praise, but for my money, Cyborg Justice is unquestionably, without a shadow of a doubt, the single best robot-based fighting game on the Sega Mega Drive. Cheers to you. Next. Number 5. My next entry is commonly regarded as bad. In fact, it's often regarded as one of the Mega Drive's very worst games. Way back when, when I did my top 20 worst Sega Mega Drive games list, a lot of people asked me why this particular game was not on there. And in fact, on other people's lists, I've seen it take out the top spot. <sighs> Ladies and gentlemen, I give to you... Beast Wrestler! A game that is, in many ways, misunderstood. Even though the graphics are amongst the worst on the system, the animation is virtually non-existent, the music is atrocious, the character designs are hilarious, I mean one of the characters is a blob for heaven's sake, the game plays slow and at best hard to figure out, and it has one of the worst cases of English I have ever seen. Ha! Even a bovis like you can handle this beast, stranger! And yet, despite all these million and one forces lining up against it, I think this game is great. In fact, this is probably the first game on the list that I absolutely, fully and unreservedly like. It's only taken us till the halfway point to get there, hasn't it? 
But the question is, why? Now I first played the game almost a decade ago, and I think I can finally explain it. It's because it's a wrestling game featuring 10 ton beasts. Yeah, simple as that. Okay, maybe not. To get this game, you have to think of it almost as if it's a fire pro game. In other words, it's a bit of a simulator. The grappling is, in fact, exactly the same as Fire Pro. It happens automatically when you collide, and it's based on nailing a small timing window. Although you can bash buttons if you wish, and it'll work out about half the time. You've also got your special move, which you can fire off intermittently when the moment's right. Beast Wrestler is just so odd. It actually feels more like wrestling than pretty much any proper MD wrestling game, funnily enough. One well-placed special move can change everything. Fights can be quick and fast, or they can be wars of attrition. Those three orbs that represent energy can disappear out of the blue, or you'll have to work your bollocks off to take them. It can all change from fight to fight. Look, the game is certainly not for everyone, and I'm sure most people who know this game probably think I'm crazy if they haven't already turned the video off. But give it a chance. Beast Wrestler is not shit at all. It's a very rough and very, very well hidden gem. You may have to go all the way down to the transverse layer to see it glimmer, but trust me, it's there. Number 4 Including two arcade games on the list, whether they're by Sega or not, could be seen as a little fishy. But I feel that I can justify both of them, and for more than just their general obscurity. Wessel War has that big nostalgia factor that's always got to be somewhere on the list, and this one, well, it's frickin' Virtua Fighter 2 on the Mega Drive, one of the last big games released on the machine, coming out as late as 1996, the latter part of. Of course, it looks virtually nothing like the arcade original, I mean, it's 2D for a start. The Virtua bit is kinda key, the game is supposed to be in 3D, meaning that for most people the idea of the game being ported to the MD was hilarious. So as a port, VF2 does not really work. It even goes as far as to take out the two new characters, leaving you with the original lot and making the two more than a little spurious. And there's a few moves missing as well. But if you just ignore all of that and concentrate on how this works as a 16-bit sprite-based 2D fighter, then it actually turns out to be quite good. I've always enjoyed this rather unique take on a Sega classic. Perhaps nostalgia factors in here a little bit too. I was pretty late to the whole 32-bit scene, so VF2's appearance on the Sega channel was welcome because I hadn't yet moved on. The 3D might not be there, but the sprites still move very well, with lots of animation and fluidity. It's clearly using every last bit of last process in the Mega Drive can muster. And may I remind you that the machine was nearly 8 years old at this point, and this game does not use any extra chips, just lots and lots of mega power. With that in mind, the game looks fantastic. But most importantly, the gameplay of Virtua Fighter 2 is largely still here. It's still a slow-paced and quite complex thinking man's fighter, where you need to ponder your moves, and where button mashing will generally get you nowhere. Considering some of the games we've seen so far, that is a freaking godsend. Does this mean it's better than the Sega Saturn version? <laughs> no, of course not. But you know, it's a nice little thank you to those who stuck with the Mega Drive to the very bitter end. AKA losers like me. Number 3 It's taken us a while, but now that we've finally reached the top 3, I can actually say that the games from here on out are all utterly great. They're not perfect, but they'd definitely get solid 8s, maybe even 9s. Hooray! It's been a pretty rough path towards that, but you should expect that when you take an already limited field, Mega Drive Fighters, and then limit it even more. Even this next game is still somewhat mocked in some circles, and is one I would consider very much underrated. It's also not a typical arcade fighter. In fact, it's a sports game. To be precise, it's one of the world's very few kickboxing simulators. So let's get right into Loisel's excellent Best of the Best. In Best of the Best, your simple task is to take a fighter and pull them up through the ranks until they become the champ, levelling them up all the way and going through fight after fight after fight. 
There's quite a bit of customization. You can choose from one of many, well about four faces, and more importantly you can select your moves from a ton of different strikes. Long range, short range, body, head, it all changes how you're going to play. You can't just go into the game mindlessly, and you have to be aware that you will get beasted from time to time. Hell, you may well start out with a couple of losses. The fight in itself is intriguing. You use a button and or a direction, much like your real old school fighters, Karateka and the like, but with a bit more mobility. Again, not a lot because this is a kickboxing match and you really want to stay in your range. But trust me, once you get it, it just feels right. One of the reasons why this game is so underrated is because a lot of people just go into it blind. They don't make any effort to know the character or learn the ropes, and thus they just haven't got a clue what to do, and of course, that's the game's fault. Just, you know, take your time, people. Inside Best of the Best is a terrific simulator, with all that you would want out of a combat sports sim. Different strategies, special moves, a lot of impact, and the occasional big comeback or even a flash knockout. The game does have some other things going against it. I won't deny that it's rather ugly, but then a lot of these fighting games are. Relative to games like Beast Wrestler and Ah Harimanada, it frankly it doesn't look so bad. It also originally came out on computers, which isn't usually a good sign, lest we forget computers also spawned the likes of Slaughter Sport. However, once it clicks, it shines, and for me the whole process of gradually improving my fighter, match after match, training session after training session, is somewhat addicting. It's probably the most addictive game on the list, in fact, and it knocks all of the MD's boxing sims right down for the count. Spend an hour or so with the game, and it may well click for you too. It's definitely worth it. Trust me. Trust me. Number 2. Yeah, this one was always going to be here. Once you take out Street Fighter, Mortal Kombat and all the other arcade ports, a lot of people might think, well, what the hell are you left with? And for many, this game would be the first that came to mind. Good old Eternal Champions. A lot of you thought this game would be number one, didn't you? After all, what else could I have chosen? But no, Eternal Champions is very good indeed, but in the end it has to settle for the one as up spot. Now I've already done a video all about Eternal Champions, so I don't need to repeat myself too much, but I'll give you a brief summary. It really shines in the presentation department. All of the fighters are so different from each other, and they all have extensive backstories, way more so than anyone in their rivals have, making this game quite special amongst fighters. The graphics are staggering, with backgrounds that are picturesque and put just about any other fighting game on the SNES to shame. The craziness of the characters is both a blessing and a curse, in that you can fight in so many different ways, but there are also a great deal of ways in which you can just flat out break the game, and you really needed two players to appreciate it, because the computer AI cheats to absolute buggery. It got a sequel on the Mega CD, which was even better, but then the franchise's candle was snuffed out by Sega in favour of Virtua Fighter. Eternal Champions was a flawed game, but it was a great start to a series that should have continued well into the 32-bit era and beyond. The potential was definitely there for it to become an established fighter franchise. Alas, it just didn't get the chance. But yeah, I kinda go through the game in detail in the video I made for it, so you should definitely watch that. But wait a minute, before you go, what game pipped it to the number one spot? Because that's obviously a game that you should be checking out too. Without any further ado, here it is. Number 1. Cuss your mind, if you will, all the way back to number 9. Uh, you know, the Dragon Ball Z game. Now I said that there was another anime to video game time that pounded that game into dust. And indeed it does. In fact, it pounds every other game on this list to dust and takes out the top spot. It was a fairly close one thin between this and Eternal Champions, but in the end, thanks to superior gameplay, absolutely stunning graphics and just flat out innovation, this game took the top spot. What game am I talking about? Well, it's based on another popular anime series I'm unfamiliar with, Yu Yu Hakusho. The name rings a bell, I guess. Much like DBZ, the series has a lot of tie-in games. 
And like the DBZ game, this game, Yu Yu Hakusho Makyu Twat Suzen, never left Japan. So yeah, I'm pretty much unfamiliar with everything about this game. Oh, except for one name. Ah yes, this my friends is a treasure game. Arguably the number one developer on the whole console, a company that made gold out of everything they touched on the Mega Drive, including, in this instance, a fighting game. So what makes Yu Yu Hakusho Makyu Twat Susan special? You can pick it up so quickly, special moves are easy and movement is so fast, and you can switch between two plates, allowing an easy way to dodge and time your opponent. Despite being so simple, it doesn't really feel like any contemporary fighter. If anything, it feels like an ancestor to Super Smash Brothers, for reasons that will become maybe a little bit more clear. Being a treasure game, you've also got the standard of art and sound you'd expect. It's gorgeous! But what really makes the game is the party factor, because this is, believe it or not, a four-player game. I'm pretty sure this is the only fighter in the 16-bit era where you can have four players at once, I mean aside from wrestling games. You know, battling it out in teams, throwing all their big special moves at one another. The team mode is just fantastic, a chaotic rumble that is completely on its own. There simply was not any other game doing this, not anywhere, not in 1994. It's as fun as it looks, believe me. So for beautiful looks, sleek as hell gameplay and sheer innovation, Yu Yu Hakusho Makyu Twat Susan wins on all counts. It's easily the best fighting game on the Mega Drive, and it's a shame that it never left Japan. I suppose that the final question is, if the restrictions were not in place, would this game have given the likes of Mortal Kombat 2, Super Street Fighter 2, you know, the really big guns, would it have given them a one for their money? And the answer is... Yes, it would have. It's certainly better than the Mega Drive port of MK2, as good as that is. And although SSF2 is an absolutely brilliant fighter, it's more suited to the arcade or the SNES. This game would have certainly given it a bloody nose at the very least. It's a full bore Mega Drive classic that deserves so much more attention, and I absolutely insist that you turn off this video and play it now. But before you do that, it's time to say goodbye. And so, there you have it, the top 10 Mega Drive fighting games without Street Fighter, Mortal Kombat, SNK games or anything, you know, that you've actually heard of. I sincerely hope you've enjoyed it, and until next time, thanks for watching, and wherever you are, whoever you be, have a good one, take care, and I'll see you next time. Bye bye.